Hey everybody, just when we think that this case couldn't get any bigger, any crazier, a 765 page document is dropped in our laps, along with 30 news outlets trying to overturn the gag order in this case. Today we are going to discuss all of the new details surrounding Brian Koberger and the horrific crime that we have all come to know. There is a lot to discuss. So guys, buckle up. My name is Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life, and let's jump right in. This is 10 to Life with Annie Elise. In a recent development, a significant update has come to light in relation to the Idaho 4 murder case. According to reports, a massive document of 765 pages has been released to the public, which includes a detailed list of over 60 search warrants that were issued to some of the major businesses out there, such as DoorDash, Verizon, Tinder, and Reddit. Now, I have my theories as to some of these businesses and why there was a search warrant on them, which we'll get to, but hang tight for a second. Now, the search warrants were issued as part of the investigation into the murder suspect, Brian Koberger. It is noteworthy that the release of this extensive document has generated a lot of interest and curiosity among the public and media alike. However, despite the massive nature of the document, the findings and the details of the investigation remain undisclosed and under lock and key. So this, of course, has led to speculation and theories regarding what the search warrants might have revealed and what implications they could have on the case. So let's go back a little bit before these search warrants came out. Following the extradition of the accused murderer, Brian Koberger, to Idaho for those brutal slayings of Kaylee, Maddie, Zanna, and Ethan, a gag order was enforced. This order prohibited any individuals associated with the case, including attorneys and law enforcement agencies, from discussing or writing about the case. Consequently, information regarding the case has been scarce, and the public has had to piece together available details, as well as rely on experts in the field who are not related to the case, to educate us and help us better understand these documents. Well, going back to this gag order, last month, Shannon Gray, the attorney representing Kaylee's family, filed an appeal against the gag order. Attorney Shannon Gray deemed it overbroad and vague and unconstitutional, citing it as a violation of their right to free speech. Now, his move has brought renewed attention to the case, as this appeal seeks to overturn the gag order and allow for a more transparent legal process. Attorney Shannon Gray stated, As an attorney for one of the victim's families, I am allowed to relay to the media any of the opinions, views, or statements of those family members regarding any part of the case. So, of course, in response to this appeal filed by Shannon Gray, Brian Koberger's public defender, Ann Taylor, lodged an objection. Ann Taylor disputed the claim that the gag order violated First Amendment rights and argued that it was not vague at all. An attorney with Ann Taylor's office wrote, If Mr. Gray truly intends only to voice his client's thoughts and opinions, then the court's previous exemption has already cured the supposed First Amendment infirmity. Mr. Gray's clients may voice these thoughts and opinions themselves, as they have clearly been doing. Laddick County Prosecutor Bill Thompson noted that the victim's families, particularly Kaylee's family, could take the stand and that they are potential witnesses in the case, including at trial and or at sentencing. In addition to the appeal filed by Kaylee's family's attorney, Shannon Gray, a coalition of 30 news organizations has requested the Idaho Supreme Court to reverse the gag order as well. The news organizations argue that the order infringes upon the right to free speech by prohibiting it from occurring in the first place. So basically, all of these news outlets are taking a writ against the Lada district judge to try to have the order reversed and have the Supreme Court say that the gag order that they imposed violates the law and that less restrictive methods are available to achieve the same thing and protect the trial. Now, quickly, if you're not familiar with what a writ is, it's basically a legal filing to object to something or to enforce some sort of motion. And I'm going to be using that word quite a bit, so I just wanted to 
you know, kind of explain the definition here. Coalition attorney Wendy Olson wrote in the court filing quoting historic court rulings about prior restraints on free speech, saying that justice cannot survive behind walls of silence, and for that reason, a responsible press has always been regarded as the handmaiden of effective judicial administration, especially in the criminal field. According to Wendy, despite the widespread public interest in the case, there have been no significant leaks of information that could compromise Brian's right to a fair trial. The Coalition of News Organizations has expressed frustration with the gag order, stating that they would have published more information about the quadruple homicide if the order was not in place. This underscores the vital role of the media in keeping the public informed and highlighting issues of concern. Nonetheless, the legal system must balance the need for transparency with the need to protect the rights of the accused and ensure a fair trial, which we all definitely believe needs to happen. We don't want anything slipping through the crack and any reason for an appeal to go through or a mistrial or anything like that. So Brian's team filed their own response to this as an interested party. So not only is Brian Koberger's team against this writ, but the prosecution is also against the writ. So we have numerous parties involved in the criminal aspect of this case opposing the writ, and then we have the media and Kaylee's family and their attorney asking for the writ. Gosh, if this were a drinking game, it would be like, take a drink every time I say writ. I'm sorry, I'll try to not use that word anymore. As the appeal process moves forward, it will be interesting to see how the courts weigh these competing interests and determine the best course of action for all of the parties involved. So now that we've talked about the gag order a little bit, let's talk about these search warrants that were released. The recent warrants issued in connection to the University of Idaho homicides have garnered significant attention. Multiple banks, multiple companies, and law enforcement agencies were served with these warrants as part of the investigation into the case. However, the contents of these warrants have been sealed by a judge, sealed in order to prevent any potential influence over the jury. The decision to seal the warrants reflects the court's responsibility to, again, uphold the integrity of the legal process and ensure a fair trial for all people involved. By preventing any potential leaks of information that could compromise the jury from being impartial, the court is taking the appropriate steps to safeguard the rights of the accused, Brian, and uphold the principles of justice. So over 60 companies, including major names such as AT&T, American Express, Bank of America, Apple, PayPal, and even Reddit, were served with warrants. However, again, the court has ordered that the contents of these warrants remained sealed, which you can imagine has fueled speculation as to what information could be inside of those warrants, specifically with Reddit and wondering if there was any sort of documented trail digitally that he was participating in threads, viewing threads about the case. One of the posters, and remember, there's been so much information of was he, who was it, Papa Rogers and the other guy that was posting all over Reddit. So a lot of people are wondering if that's why there was a search warrant for Reddit. Same thing with Facebook, the Papa Rogers account, Tinder, seeing who he was dating, if he had an active romantic history, how he was maybe engaging in these conversations. So without the information of the contents of these warrants, you can imagine it is just fueling the theories out there. And the court did note that the documents include highly intimate facts or statements that could be considered objectionable to a reasonable person. Additionally, there are concerns that certain facts or statements contained within the document could potentially endanger the safety or lives of individuals. Among the others served with warrants is the Moscow Police Department Forensic Lab and K-Bar Knives, because we all know it was previously revealed that cops were searching for a Rambo-style knife such as a K-Bar brand combat blade that was used in the murders. We also know that a brown leather knife sheath was left behind that featured K-Bar, USMC, and the United States Marine Corps' Eagle Globe and Anchor insignia on it, and that was left behind and found at the grisly crime scene. So this is a full list of warrant recipients. And as we go through it, I want you to just like, as the video's playing in the comment section, let me know for whatever business and item why you think that there was a warrant there. Just curious. I'm not trying to like fuel the rumor mill or fuel speculation, but I am just curious what you believe the intent was or what they were looking for with these particular businesses. So as we're going through, just comment in the chat. Amazon, American Express, Apple, Three warrants to AT&T, Bank of America, Banner Bank in Spokane, Washington, 
Block Inc., which is formerly known as Square, which is a payment method, Blue Ridge Knives in Marion, Virginia, Charter Communications, which is also Cox, the digital um, cable provider, Coeur d'Alene Police Department Forensic Lab, Discover Bank, Elan Financial Services, Idaho Central Credit Union, Idaho Department of Labor, Numerica Credit Union, Potlatch Number One Financial Credit Union, Umpok Bank, and I don't think I'm saying that right, Wells Fargo, Verizon Wireless, Washington State University, DoorDash, cloud, a cloud networking company called Extreme Networks, Google, Indland Cellular, K-Bar Knives, Match Group LLC, who owns 45 different dating sites like Tinder, Hinge, OkCupid, R-Time, Meta Platforms, which is, which is Facebook's parent company, Moscow Police Department Forensic Lab, PayPal and Venmo, Reddit, Snapchat, UPS, and then two warrants for Verizon Wireless. Which, did I say Verizon? Maybe I did. Sorry if I said that twice. So included in the list, Walmart, Yahoo, Yik Yak, which is an app that apparently is super popular between college students where you can post anonymously, which technically I get that Brian was, I guess, a student, but like to be on this app, it is kind of weird in my opinion. So out of that list, what stands out to you as is this just a catch-all and were they just trying to get search warrants on all of these companies to then see what information they found and see what makes sense? Or were they looking for something specific that they would find from that company? Something that stands out to me is Reddit, of course, for reasons I've already said, Tinder and the dating profiles. Also something that, not to get too conspiracy, stands out is DoorDash. There has been a lot of speculation. I personally never thought this, but I, th I know a lot of people out there did. There was a lot of speculation that he was the DoorDash driver that night for the order that came to the house and was delivered to Xana from, I believe it was Jack in the Box. And I think people had thought this because the closest Jack in the Box was like closer to where he lived in Washington to Pullman or something like that. So a lot of people said he was the DoorDash driver. He ordered the delivery to their house to see if anybody was home, something like that. So I'm curious if there is any truth to that and if not, why would they want a search warrant for DoorDash? Unless he was sending more things, I don't know. Why else are you looking for like what this guy's ordering and eating? Unless, of course, also they were looking to see if the Mad Greek had delivered to him at any point, which I don't know if they would deliver that far. I don't know if the Mad Greek is even on DoorDash, but these are all things to think through. And again, why a lot of the people in the public are kind of spinning off the rails about these companies. But what do you think? Although not new to the investigation, these recently uncovered search warrants provided pretty intriguing information. It was revealed that law enforcement had previously served search warrants to companies such as Amazon, Walmart, and eBay, requesting information on customers who had purchased a K-Bar knife or a leather knife sheath before Brian's arrest back in December. It remains uncertain whether or when we will have access to the results of the search warrants, and it seems like the only information we'll, we will receive are these redacted documents. As a result, it's likely that we won't hear any more developments on the findings of these until the preliminary hearing at the end of June. That, Trent Copeland, is the best guy to talk to because there are all sorts of reasons why warrants like that would go out, and they may not be exactly as we think. So Trent, when you see the big long list, First thing that comes to your mind? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is the police are much further ahead in this investigation than we give them credit for. Because remember, actually, there have been some people who have criticized the, the, uh, the Idaho police, um, calling them Keystone cops, small town cops, not big enough for this job. I think we have to take another look at that. And I'm not one of those persons that believes that, never did at any point. But I think we've got to give them their kudos at this point. They are far ahead in this investigation, much further ahead than I think any of us ever knew. And what we know is that what police are attempting to do at this point is triangulate the evidence. I think what this all suggests is that their search warrant suggests that first, they're seeking to establish that there was a digital connection between Coburger and the victim. That's why Tinder, Match, all of those other um, companies, uh, many of whom have the dating app websites, particularly Tinder, Yik Yak, and remember, Yik Yak, very popular with, with college kids, very popular because you can communicate anonymously. I think what police are establishing or attempting to establish is that there is a digital connection between Koberger and these victims, and not just any old random connection, but a deep personal connection such that, and I think you suggested a moment ago, such that intimate things may have been exchanged. Koberger may have said things to these women sexually. 
Koberger may have said things to these women because he was attempting to go out on a date with them. He may have been rebuffed by them. So those are the kind of things that I think we're looking at in the search warrant. And second, I think the digital evidence also establishes that the, the motive potentially, because I think once the evidence is established and can be established that there was a digital connection between Koberger and these women, I think we'll also begin to see that maybe having been rebuffed by Kaylee, having been rebuffed by Maddie, that may establish the motive for why he was so obsessed with them and why and he guessing. wanted to be banned for having been there. Right. We're, we're guessing about the Kaylee Maddie business because what yes. we do know yeah. is that Koberger had oh, reached yes. out to one yeah. of these victims. Um, and then we have sources at News Nation who we've spoken to close to this investigation who said that um, it, there was more um, towards Maddie and that right. neither of them had responded. So that can be certainly looked at as a rebuff, even though many times people don't even yeah. see their DMs. I know there's a lot of DMs I don't see. So I want to bring in now Dr. Sarah Daly. She is a criminologist who dedicated much of her life's work to studying incels and mass violence. And Dr. Daly, it's great to have you. I think the most important thing, you know, before we even begin our conversation is to kind of define incels and discuss why that's important when we look at this particular case involving Brian Koberger and the allegations against him. So as simple as you can, give our audience that, that, that the real Reader's Digest version of what an incel is and why there's so much connection to Koberger. Thanks for having me on. Uh, incels, very simply put, are men who are involuntarily celibate. Uh, they want to be in romantic and sexual relationships, but they can't achieve them for any number of reasons, including their physical appearance, uh, mental illness or personality problems, or just that they've missed milestones in their lives. So they generally exist on the Internet uh, and they communicate with each other on forums and they are notorious for uh, vile language to discuss women, uh, attractive women, sex havers. Uh, so they're mad at men, too. Um, and so they really feel very spurned by society. And I think we've we've gotten to this point with Brian Koberger because we're still looking for a motive. Um, and because these were attractive young women, um, one with her boyfriend. So I think it's not a far leap for a lot of people to question if Brian Koberger is an incel. So one of the um, prevailing theories right now is that there's a connection to Elliot Roger. Elliot Roger is considered like Saint ER, they call him. They think he's the, the father of the incel movement. In 2014, um, he killed six people and wounded more than 12 near UC Santa Barbara. And he wrote a manifesto. And on page 118 of his manifesto, and there's a reason that I seized that particular passage. I just want to read it. All right, here's how it goes. Women must be punished for their crimes of rejecting such a magnificent gentleman as myself. All of those popular boys must be punished for enjoying heavenly lives and having sex with all the girls while I had to suffer in lonely virginity. I lived in a college town full of young, attractive students who partied and had sex all the time, and I didn't get to experience any of it. And now we learn that there was one item that was seized from Brian Koberger's parents' home in Pennsylvania. And it's only described as a book with underlining on page 118. The problem I have here is that it would be a perfect connection if the manifesto was a book, but uh, it's not. It's a, it's a it's an online thing. So this is a tricky thing. If if Elliot Rogers' manifesto was printed out and bound and made into a book, and page one eighteen was was highlighted, I could see the connection between Brian Koberger, who some think had the Facebook handle Papa Roger, co you know, commenting on the murders and having a lot of intimate knowledge about the murders before we all knew about it. Um, but that is awfully um, it's awfully coincidental that they see something that's underlined uh, with, with on a page 118. It certainly is. And there are many concerning things throughout that Isla Vista shooters writing that could have resonated with someone who is isolated or frustrated. 
And it's like you said, though, the, the only thought that gives me pause is that it is an online document. It's possible he could have had it printed and bound, which I've actually done with the same document for research. Uh, but it also could have been any number of criminology or criminal justice related books. A lot of it's just the content that we consume in doctoral programs and in our work. So much of this is more than likely going to be uh, revealed um, in evidence once we eventually can, you know, get beneath the gag order uh, close to trial date or within the trial itself. But it will be fascinating and certainly ripe for a new conversation. Dr. Daly, thank you so much. Now moving on to the next detail. Further details have emerged about Brian Koberger's conduct on the night that he was apprehended. Law enforcement officials arrived at his family resident in Chestnut Hill Township of Albrightsville, Virginia, or Pennsylvania, not Virginia, sorry. And this is located in the Indian Mountain Lake Estates in the, near the Poconos, and they arrived at just before 1.30 a.m. on December 30th. Apparently, Brian was discovered in the kitchen area, dressed in shorts and a shirt and sporting latex medical gloves while separating his personal trash and storing it in distinct Ziploc baggies. It's believed that Brian's activities and demeanor during the early hours of that morning may offer insight into his mental state and could potentially have significant implications in court. It could very well explain some of the other aspects of the case, some of the lengths that a person would go to to avoid having their DNA left behind when they know or should know that there was an investigation underway. Now, when we first heard these details, what stuck out to me is on my previous video where we went over everything that was found and discovered on his person during the time of arrest, we had talked about some of the weird items. There was like a flashlight, the gloves, the baggies. And my question was like, okay, what is this dude doing at 1.30 or 3 in the morning holding a flashlight and having all of these latex gloves? Like clearly something shady is weird was going on. So tell me how you would respond because the word that comes to my mind when I hear that is calculated, is sneaky, grimy, creepy, but calculated. Because how would you respond or what word would come to your mind? If you walk into a house where you're going to arrest somebody, you see them parked up at the kitchen table, separating their trash into Ziploc baggies, wearing gloves, maybe holding the flashlight or having the flashlight in his mouth, doing this in the dark in the middle of the night. It's weird. It's weird. And again, to me, it is calculated. It's like you're doing something sneaky and it's, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. That's just my opinion, but I don't like it. According to other sources that include current and former inmates, as well as jail sources, Brian is reported to be pretty busy with following updates on his case from behind bars. And also, he apparently has recently become religious, attending mass every Sunday. Now, is this newfound religion real or is it a ploy to look as though he's reformed? You be the judge. I personally have said it on many videos before. If you're truly finding God and becoming spiritual, good on you if that's something that you believe in. But I feel like so many people often use that as a ploy as to sell the reason as to why they are reborn and a new person. But you tell me what you think. But let's go back to some of these habits and him like being obsessed with his own case. These sources revealed that some of Brian's habits and behaviors while incarcerated, including him having daytime access to television and often tuning into news coverage of his case inside his private cell. One inmate even stated that he watches himself all the time. Now, I have to say, when I first heard this, I was irked, but also it didn't surprise me at all. Because everything we have come to know or learn about Brian over the past few months is that by all accounts from people who knew him, he's somewhat of a narcissist in a way of he always thinks he's right, he thinks he's smarter than everybody else, he thinks he can't get caught, which, oops, again, he's innocent until proven guilty, but you get where I'm going with that. So we've heard that he's kind of ha he kind of has this behavior and thinks that he's better and smarter than everybody else. So when I heard this, that he watches his own news coverage, I was irked and weirded out, but also not surprised, not surprised at all, because it seems very in line with his character of wanting to know everything that's being said about him, wanting to know what evidence they have against him, who have they caught on to certain things. Also, I think it could potentially be a strategy, uh, in a sense, to where if he's hearing 
what some of the theories are or the evidence that has been found. He could be strengthening his defense, even though he's not representing himself. He could be coming up with excuses for these things and reasoning once it gets to trial or once it gets to the hearing. But honestly, I think it's more likely that it's this personal consumption because he wants to know what everybody's talking about. He wants to know, what does everybody know? What's everybody saying about me? I think it's something that has to do with ego, which again is something we have heard time and time again that has played into his past. Not Ashley Banfield speaking directly to Brian Koberger last night after hearing that he has a TV in his jail cell. He's got his own TV. So the reason I wanted to speak directly to Brian Koberger was not because I just assume he would be watching my show. No, I also learned today that Brian Koberger likes to consume his own media. He likes to follow his own case. He likes to listen to the news when it's about him. So, Brian, this show is going to be a lot about you. Uh, call me sometime. Because we're also learning that you're allowed to make phone calls out. You're just not allowed to get them in. You're also allowed to make FaceTime calls and have been doing so with your family. The alleged victims of the quadruple murder you're charged with, they cannot communicate with their families. And those families have said they sure would love an opportunity to talk to their kids. Even if their kids were in jail, they would just love the chance to talk to their kids. FaceTime just once, but they can't ever again, never will they hear their kids' voices ever again. But Brian Koberger gets to hear voices, maybe even mine right now. Hello, Brian Koberger. We're learning a lot more about you tonight. And on this program, the viewers who are listening right now along with you are going to learn a lot more. Now, going back to the religion that we talked about, apparently Brian has been attending weekly prayer meetings with a local pastor at this correctional facility where he is being held. It has been reported that he steps out of his cell around 7 p.m. every Sunday to be led in prayer and have his own private mass, which imagine having that job and being with Brian and having to pray with him and walk him to Mass. I don't know. I don't know. I don't like it. Again, just my opinion. Sources within the jail are saying that Brian has been a well-behaved prisoner since his incarceration in January, opting to spend most of his time in solitude and refraining from responding to any taunts or insults that are thrown at him from other inmates. Although Brian is said to be quiet in jail, Fellow inmates reportedly know the details of the heinous crime that he is accused of, and they too closely follow the news coverage of the case, discussing it with each other daily. One former inmate stated that he had only seen Brian a few times, reporting him wearing an orange sweatsuit and two guards accompanying him wherever he needs to go. Brian is one of the 17 inmates at the jail, and while he is allowed to sit with the other inmates, he is not permitted to interact with them. Something that bothers me here is Brian apparently even has access to mental health services, but so far he has not expressed any interest in meeting with a mental health professional. When I heard this, again my immediate thought, and I could be wrong, was it's ego. If he has found God and found religion and all of these things, and he's, you know, reformed or trying to be re rehabilitated, again, assuming he is guilty, but you're not willing to talk with a therapist or a mental health professional or anything like that. Is it because you don't think you need to? Because you think you're better? Because you don't want them to suss out anything? I don't know. I have some questions there. We also learned that Brian Koberger's defense team has been given approval to add another attorney to their team. The request was made by Ann Taylor, and it was granted by a judge. Some speculate that this move suggests the possibility of the prosecution seeking the death penalty, which honestly, I don't know. I kind of already thought that this was going to be an obvious strategy. I think anyone that is involved with this case thinks that it's relatively obvious that the prosecution will in fact go for the death penalty in this case. There is no reason under the law why they wouldn't, especially given that the state of Idaho has 11 factors that would justify such a penalty under the law. Additionally, the state's administrative code requires at least two death-qualified attorneys to be present during a death penalty trial. While the prosecution doesn't have to declare their intentions until 30 days after the initial arraignment, which will probably only come after the probable cause hearing, it's possible that we won't hear any official word on the matter until late July. 
It's understandable why Ann Taylor would want to have her defense team prepared for this potential outcome, though. We know that Ann Taylor is a death penalty qualified attorney to take on any death penalty case, but Ann had to travel a considerable distance to take on this case. The state of Idaho keeps a roster of death qualified attorneys, which comprises fewer than 50 lawyers in the state. To be a death qualified attorney, one must have prior experience representing clients in death penalty cases and possess years of experience. The Idaho Code outlines several factors that must be considered when selecting an attorney for such cases, including availability. Public defender offices have a maximum caseload, so availability is a crucial factor when selecting an attorney. So a lot to kind of unpiece and piece back together here, and I want to know your thoughts about everything that we discussed here today. Do you think that the gag order should be thrown out, or do you think it should stay in place as to keep the integrity when it goes to trial? Also, what do you think of all of those search warrants that were issued? Is there a particular business that you think they were looking for something? Or was this a catch-all? They're just trying to piece together all information possible? Or were there specific markers? And for which business and why? Let me know what you think. Also, what do you think about Brian consuming all of the content about his own case? Should he have access to coverage of his own case? Or I don't want to say conflict of interest, but is that a conflict? Is that kind of odd? And lastly, my biggest question, which I've had in so many cases, is how in the world do you find a jury that's never heard about this case? I wouldn't be surprised, and I don't know if this has already been discussed, overturned, or, you know, pushed, whatever the word I'm looking for is, um, negated, whatever. I wouldn't be surprised, though, if they try to move this case out of this jurisdiction, trying to say they're trying to find, you know, more of an impartial jury, that they, you know, need to go to a county where nobody has heard of him, which, again, good luck. But I wouldn't be surprised if that becomes a tactic down the line. But if you've heard otherwise or if they've tried this already and they were it was overruled or whatever, let me know in the comments. But I wouldn't be surprised if that's a move because because to have the trial in the same area where so many locals are close to it and have been affected and impacted by this tragedy, it seems like that would be a conflict and it would be tough to find a jury, but I don't know where he would go that they wouldn't find a jury that has never heard about this case. So let me know what you guys think about this in the comment section below, especially about those search warrants. As I mentioned, I'm keeping you guys updated for sure on this case. I'm not jumping on every single day or even every other day when little bite-sized pieces of information are released. I like to wait a week or so to get all of the information so that I can come on here and give you one full comprehensive video about everything rather than like these little bite-sized pieces. So I always will give you the updates. If you haven't subscribed yet and you want to make sure you don't miss any of those, just make sure you hit subscribe really quick. Otherwise, if you want more real-time updates in every day, every hour as they're going on, Make sure you're following along on Instagram if you're not already, which is at underscore Annie Elise, because I am able to jump on my Instagram stories, you know, that moment as breaking news happens, and then I come back over here onto YouTube. So if you're not following along there yet, make sure you do so. Also, really quick, I want to make a quick mention, and I posted it on my community tab already, but in case you don't follow that or in case you haven't seen it, I do have a second channel as a backup, which right now I'm utilizing as more behind the scenes content. So if you aren't subscribed to that, I highly encourage you to go subscribe, not only to view the behind the scenes content, but in the event that something ever happens to this channel, we're going to jump over to that one because, you know, they like to flag me. And that channel, I will leave it in the comment section below, but it's also Annie Elise Diaries that you can just search in the search bar. So make sure you're following along on that one if you're not yet, just in case something ever does happen to this channel. And then in the meantime, you'll just see all the behind the scenes content with like my studio, my house, family, little things like that. Um, All right, guys, so I will keep you updated. Thanks for tuning in with me today, and until the next one, stay safe. Bye.